Welcome back, everyone, and welcome to those who have not yet joined us. We are here at the annual meeting of the Global Alliance for Banking on Values with a title that is important to be saying, Banking for Good in an Age of Change, How Values Can Secure a Positive Future. We have a special guest today, and I'm very delighted to introduce him. Uh, who is bringing a story to us, Back to the Commons, Five Turnarounds for the World. And his name is Jorgen Ronders, maybe well familiar to some of you. Um, when we're all asked to take a wider systems perspective, one of the people who has been doing this and has had it as his field of inquiry for decades is Jorgen Ronders. He's Professor Emeritus of Climate Strategy at the BI Norwegian Business School. His field is the global future. He works on issues related to climate, energy, and sustainability. And he lectures and serves as an advisor to policymakers and governments around the world. Uh, uh, having said to me that he's been working with China since 2006. He's spent one third of his life in academe, a third in business, and a third in the NGO world, which gives him the lenses from these different perspectives. He was the president of the Norwegian Business School uh, for nearly 10 years. He was the director general of WWF International, and he's been the chair of three Norwegian banks, uh, each one with a, a different perspective uh, in investment banking, uh, a government bank, and a bank that is uh, more like ours working in the real economy. Uh, he's a full member of the Club of Rome. Uh, one paper that may stand out for you is that he is the co-author along with his colleagues of Limits to Growth in 1972. And his recent writings include 2052, a global forecast for the next 40 years. And in 2012, he wrote Transformation is Feasible with Johan Rockström, who was one of our presenters uh, last year. Um, I invite you to put your questions in the chat. So as you hear Jorgen speaking, uh, and I have to say that every time I work with Jorgen, he makes me think. So when you've got something that is provoking you, put it in the chat and we will be able to have a conversation. I'll be able to feed your questions into the, into the stage. Uh, immediately following this, we're going to have a premium stage dialogue with three of our CEOs, and I'll say more about that later. Jorgen, great to see you, and welcome to the Global Alliance for Banking on Values. Well, thank you, Tom. Thanks for the nice words, and thanks for this opportunity to talk to a large number of people whom I have never seen and probably never will see. Both you and I have lived through decades with continuing debate about the global future, sustainability, limited resources, overpopulation, climate change, and so on, with accompanying calls for reduced consumption and more equality. I'm part guilty for this debate as a co-author of the infamous book, The Limits to Growth, as mentioned by Tom in 1972. In that book, we warned about the risk that humanity would overshoot planetary boundaries in the 21st century and subsequently be forced back below planetary boundaries. In the words of limits, unless there is strong action, the world will overshoot and collapse. I know many of you listened to limits. It was one reason you founded your banks. Uh, but unfortunately, you are not the majority. Most people never read the limits. Today, 50 years later, I'm working with a new group of scientists to complete a new uh, model-based study, this time called, as Tom said, Earth for All. Also this time for the Club of Rome. And our goal is to try to give science-based and systems-based answers to the following three fairly obvious questions. What is really going to happen in the world over the next 50 years? Uh, can anything be done to improve the situation? And what should you do? You know, running your banks, what could you do? The Earth for All model is made to help calculate what will happen to put numbers on this. 
what it will cost to improve the situation and even tell us how fast we need to act. So, unless there is dramatic deviation from current decision-making styles at the individual, corporate, national and global level, the Earth for All team sees the following broad trends towards the end of the century. And now I ask that my one and only slide is shown. I will not talk about the slide. It is there to remind you of my very high level of aggregation and my very long uh, time horizon. Uh, point number one, the global population will continue to grow to a level which would require three planets if we were to lift all the people to $15,000 per person a year in GDP, which is the income level needed in order to satisfy most of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. The global GDP, the blue line, it will continue to grow and with it the use of energy, food and materials so that climate emissions, resource use, land erosion and biodiversity loss will double uh, the human ecological footprint by the end of the century. But notice that we will even this will not be enough to remove absolute poverty in the poorest parts of the world. Three there will be continuing rise in inequity, both within nations and among nations, like what we have seen in the, in the US over the last 40 years, where 70% of all households have not had a real income rise since 1980 when I lived in, in that country, while the remaining few percents have become many, many times richer. Four, global warming. Uh, the black line, will uh, reach uh, plus two and a half degrees centigrade by the end of the century and melt all land ice, increase the sea level by some three feet and start irreversible processes like thawing of the permafrost. And fifthly, and very novel in this model, social tension will arise, sometimes involving, evolving into social conflict because people see no progress. They will be frustrated by declining well-being, the green line, defined as decline in the sum of disposable income, governmental services, equality, environmental quality, and social participation. In summary, well-being will decline because an expanding human footprint will gradually destroy the physical environment. Social tensions will rise because life for the working majority will become increasingly unbearable as decades pass without fundamental solution to the problems of global poverty, inequity and disempowerment. It will not help at all that the climate will worsen from decade to decade. The regions will differ significantly. The rich nations will face climate change and rising inequity and the poorer nations will face climate change and enduring poverty. In other words, sadly, our Earth for All model indicates that we will not see a strong global response to the human overshoot, climate overshoot, at least not strong enough to stop global warming in this century. Nor will we see an accelerated effort to remove absolute poverty within this generation. Rather, we think, we will see a too little, too late scenario, which is the one you are looking at, where human well-being declines and social tensions rise towards the middle of the 21st century and then moves horizontally thereafter. And now you can stop my one slide so you can look at my lovely face once more. Of course, there will be huge regional differences. In the rich world, we will see slow decline in well-being and uh, rise in internal inequity, wealth accumulation being the main uh, culprit. In the global south, we will see lacking economic pro progress and as a consequence, enduring poverty. In some emerging economies, we will see temporary material progress. And in China, we believe we will see the continuing rise of a world superpower over the next 30 to 50 years.
And all over the world, there will be continued warming, more extreme weather, rising biodiversity loss, and sporadic resource scarcity in new and changing uh, niches. Sadly, this is not a pretty picture. There will be growth in population and GDP, and growth-oriented people might applaud that. But there will be, at the same time, decline in average well-being. And this will occur in an interconnected world where the economy interacts with ecology and social affairs. And it will be a world of social friction and possibly social collapse, at least regional collapse. We call it, as I said, too little, too late. Humanity is already in overshoot, as warned by the limits to growth 50 years ago. The world is in unsustainable territory above planetary limits. The most obvious proof is that the planet is getting warmer every decade because we are emitting more greenhouse gases than every year than is absorbed in the oceans and the forests of the world. However, the global society has not yet experienced collapse, you know, the second part of the limits to growth analysis, at least not global collapse. Neither from resource scarcity, emission of chemicals or toxics, land erosion, nor from ecosystem depletion. But we are seeing emerging signs of local collapse, not necessarily driven by resource scarcity, pollution or biodiversity loss, but caused by excessive social tension and conflict. Social tensions arising from a continuing decline in human well-being, in turn driven by declining uh, or uh, rising poverty, rising inequity, rising disempowerment, and sheer frustration with the slow global response to global warming. So in sum, the Earth for All team expects continuing decline in average well-being over the decades ahead. This will read, lead, among other things, to erosion in the ability of society to agree on collective action and actually act. So the less trust there is in the system, the harder it will be for the authorities to make the necessary adjustments. This is a most insidious systems effect. It makes it necessary for us to act before we get into the vicious spiral of declining trust, declining ability to act, and leading to further decline in well-being and even lower trust. As I see it, the mid-income world is not stuck in the income trap, which is heralded by conventional macroeconomic theory. Uh, on the other, uh, opposite to this, most of the world is actually facing a trust trap, where slow progress leads to broken hopes, rising social tension, and less trust, which in turn reduces the nation's ability to solve the problem and improve general well-being. What to do? My colleagues and I have spent the last decade and written three books on the topic trying to ad identify the smallest possible set of action that is uh, indeed capable of solving the problem. And the problem is to ensure rising well-being for the global majority on our finite planet. Or perhaps a little less ambitious, to avoid a continuing decline in the average well-being for the global majority. We now believe that five extraordinary efforts, we call them the five global turnarounds, they are needed and to improve the situation in five areas. First, in the climate area, we need to shift from fossil energy to low carbon energy in order to stop greenhouse gas emissions. In the poverty area, we need to eliminate absolute poverty worldwide. And in order to do so, we must use new development models freed from the Washington Consensus straitjacket that has not led to any significant development over the last uh, 40 to 50 years. In the food area, we need to change from conventional agriculture that destroys the ecosystem to regenerative agriculture and healthy diets in order to stop the ecosystem uh, destruction. 
In the population area, we must, must provide education, health, contraception, and opportunity to women in order to create, first of all, a fair, and secondly, a stable uh, society. And fifth, last but not least, we need large-scale transfer of income from the world's rich to the global poor in order to reduce inequity and in order to reduce the risk of revolution. Basically, we must reduce the human footprint so it fits within the carrying capacity of the planet and still leaves sufficient room for nature so it can also thrive. And we must ensure that the rich pay the bill. Our view is that nothing less will do. We need a long-term plan in order to ensure higher and sustainable well-being for the global majority. And we need an overall strategy. In our view, this is a global division of labor where the rich reduce their footprint while the poor continue to grow their incomes. 12% of the world population live in rich countries. One billion people, they're responsible for 80% of the footprint. It's their responsibility in this century to reduce dramatically the emissions, resource use, and nat nature destruction per rich person, even if it costs. The poorer nations of the world, containing 5 billion people, are only responsible for 10% of the footprint and should not waste time on reducing that. They should do what they can in order to increase the disposable income for their poor majorities. And since they have not had much success in the last 50 years, as I just mentioned, it might be a good idea to change development model. I personally say look to China. Many of my colleagues doubt that this is a good uh, idea. So the challenge is not what you might believe, to identify what needs to be done. The challenge is to make it happen, to agree, decide, and implement the five turnarounds, and to do it fast enough to break the vicious cycle where declining well-being leads to rising social tension, less trust, and diminished collective capacity to solve problems. In short, we must stop the decline in well-being before society is no longer able to agree and act with strength and speed. Luckily, at this time, we know that the five turnarounds are technically feasible using existing technologies, and we know that the cost is tolerable. It is not zero, uh, but it is not exceedingly high. The Earth for All model shows that the total cost of the five turnarounds amounts to a few percent, say two to four percent of global income. So we can change the course of history by shifting a few percent of the world's capital and labor from dirty to clean sectors. The bill is so small that it can easily be paid for by the world's 10 percent richest who jointly control 50% of world income. The Earth for All model shows that it is possible to turn the tide of well-being loss before 2050, but it will require very quick, very strong, and very well-coordinated action by national governments. In short, a very strong state with a, a meaningful budget. This is necessary because the turnarounds will not happen uh, by themselves. They are not profitable from the investor point of view, and they will require subsidies or bans to get going at scale and speed. This in turn will require political support from voters who do not typically like higher taxes and more regulations. And these are voters who additionally justly fear losing their current fossil job before the new green job materializes. So gathering a political majority for the action that is absolutely necessary is going to be hard, given that the incumbents are not in favor, but there is actually no alternative the way we see it. In conclusion, I believe the main global challenge in this decade is, as I said, to God gather popular report, support for strong collective action. 
I'm afraid this can only be done if we pay for the necessary action in unconventional ways, to use a nice word. For example, by passing the bill to the rich minority. Passing the bill to the 10% richest people in the world has the extra advantage of reducing inequity and social tension and the risk of revolution. Another approach would be to pay COVID style with governmental loans that are not intended to be paid back. Trying to solve the problem through higher taxes is unlikely to find broad support in society that are already short-term and very unfair. There is a fourth solution, which I personally favor, but again, my colleagues do not, which is simply to print money. So countries with their own currency can, of course, in a controlled manner, print 2 to 4% of the money supply and use it to invest in a long-term future. So, in my mind, it can be done. It is possible to reverse the trend of declining well-being before 2050. The global response to COVID shows that this is the fact. It is possible for national governments to act swiftly, with force, and still retain broad support for strong action. This COVID strategy must now be repeated in, a global in the global effort to increase human well-being within planetary boundaries. Earth for All shows it can be done, but it will require broad popular support for strong collective action and quickly before we get social collapse. What should you do? What can you do? What can the banking world do? The first thing you can do is to help spread the message, to help convince a political majority that the world needs strong state action, paid by the rich, and that unconventional funding, read printing money or borrowing, not having the plan to pay back, may actually be the best way out, in spite of the inflationary threat. Secondly, you must stress that what needs to be done is not profitable. If it had been profitable, as many people try to argue, in this capital-rich world of ours, we would have seen floods of money into the ESG type activities, the sustainability investments, we do not. We are in the process of inventing all kinds of weird uh, packaging in order to cheat people into putting money into things that is not profitable, but is actually necessary in order to create a better world in the future. Thirdly, it, it means that you need to speak warmly about subsidies and bans, although this causes you pain, given your, uh, I ask, expect, uh, normal point of view on matters like this. And finally, you should make the point that there is a natural division of labor between the rich, poor, and the poor world. It is not the poor world that should start tightening its belt, its resource belt, its food belt at this point in time. The poor should spend the time trying to create higher productivity and higher incomes in their nations. While we should leave it to the rich, you know, the, the US, the Euro Europe and China for that matter, who between them control most of the climate emissions that bothers uh, the rest of us. And finally, remember that uh, even the five turnarounds is not a golden bullet or five silver bullets. They need to be supplemented by a large number of small things that pull in the right directions. Small things that you and I and everyone else can actually do on a daily basis, which will not solve the problem, but certainly helps. So all I can do, Good luck in your good fight for a better world for the global majority. Thank you. Thank you, Jorgen. Um, I'm glad also there was a kind of turnaround in your speech that you started to give us some solutions and some guidelines.
Um, <clears throat> I, I'm a long way from saying they're optimists and pessimists now. What we're looking for, what is the eye for possibility in what we're doing? We have a number of questions. One of the questions from David Woods um, and and others is when we look at what's happening over the last weeks in Ukraine, how do you create sufficient geopolitical stability um, and will to drive the changes you're outlining? How do you bring Russia, China, and the West together? And is this the edges of what you were describing as the, the social challenges that we're going to see before we see even more of the, of, of, of the climate challenges? Uh, this is a very good question. I have heard it before today, <laughs> Just, uh, and it is, uh, the answer is interesting. Yes, clearly, this is an example of the social frictions that I am, tensions that I'm talking about. But much more interestingly, uh, Ukraine and Russia, uh, actually, it's the Russian gas, which is the, the interesting part here, uh, is most interested in a short-term versus long-term perspective. You know, what is happening now is the, the action and the tremendous increase in the prices is, of course, causing a lot of damage on households, on businesses, etc., and should, of course, not have happened. But you must think about the long-term effect of doing this, which is very positive. You know, finally... Europe has gotten the kick in the ass, which is necessary, you know, in order to really start thinking through the dependency on fossil fuels, and particularly fossil fuels coming from the rest of the world. They got the first kick when limits came out 50 years ago, and now comes the second one. So I think that 20 years down the line, when all of this is over, you know, we will write history and thank the Russians for doing the idiotic things and the stupid and ugly thing they're doing now because it finally got us to act. We see the parallel thing in NATO. You know, finally, even backward countries like my own is now starting to think about the fact that we might actually spend 2% of the GDP on defense. Hmm. And this is having an incredible effect in the short term, of course, on human lives as well. Um, yes, yes. Martin Rohner asks, what political systems are most conducive to such a social transformation? Um, how uh, do you think about more centralized action without cutting into democratic norms and, and values? It's, this is a, a very interesting uh, discussion. I will start by giving the end answer. You know, because the thinking is so long that it might bore you. I think that the ultimate solution in well-functioning democratic market economies is that the parliament chooses a, a, a superior uh, court. What is it called? A, a high, uh, so the, a, a two-chamber parliament. And so you, from the democratically elected people, you choose 10. And they are for life parts of the top system. And they have veto rights on, for instance, any decision that leads to a change in the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in the country. So you're actually putting in place uh, the Supreme Court solution of the United States, where you then give someone the authority to execute that uh, uh, constitution. That's, that's my end. The discussion getting there is very complicated. I think that the Chinese solution, having 90 million people as members, you know, 7% of the population, as members of the elite that actually governs the country, is not bad, as long as uh, acceptance into the elite is meritocratic, that you can't buy your way in, that you must have run a good city or a big company or something in order to become a member. That's the second best. I think this this uh, is a great start for a debate. Uh, Walter von Biesen said, you look at politics um, and state to lead the turnaround. Banks, in your view, uh, should fuel public support for this. Does this mean that we cannot do anything meaningful in our current banking activities? Oh, do you love to ask yes and no questions, huh? like any journalist? Uh, 
clearly you can do a lot. You know, the, the, the most useful thing you can do is not to invest in dirty projects, even if they're wildly profitable. I know that this means that the neighboring bank is going to make a lot of money on that, but at least you're doing, again, a second best by shying away from those things that should not be done if you have the long-term perspective. And I have to say that many of our banks are in that place. So isn't there a solution in creating more uh, innovations and coming up with uh, new products, new services? Is that going to get us there? So the point is here that you, uh, it's clear <laughs> that, uh, that uh, uh, so most of the innovations that will ultimately make it cheaper to, to reduce emissions are, of course, state-funded. You know, it's not private business that invented the, the web. It is the publicly funded research institutions. So what you should be doing is, of course, to put a lot of money into solar energy and all those other things. The point is that that's not necessary. We already have those solutions in place that we need for the next 30 years. And the excuse currently that we should try to lower the cost of other things you know, is simply a way of trying to avoid, you know, using the solutions that we already have because they are not wildly profitable at this point in time. So I'm not particularly interested in innovation over the next 30 years. I'm much more interested in implementation of what we already have. I, I, ran, I ran the Norwegian government's climate commission 15 years ago. And we made a plan for how to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions of Norway. We could do so using known technology at the cost of only 1% of the GDP. So we have a question from uh, the research head at uh, the Global Alliance, Adriana kokornik mina She said, which global collaborative platforms do you know of that you see could enable collaboration? Do we have some some prototypes? Do we have some examples of what's working in <laughs> any of the five turnarounds? <laughs> Why don't you ask another question? Yeah, I, 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 this is interesting. I spent five years of my life in one of the perhaps most successful collaborative arrangements, namely WWF, with a you know, lovely idea of trying to protect nature. But when you see the amount of infighting and problems, political problems you have, even in a 3,000 person uh, operation like this, you know, it's, it is not easy to point to something that works well without a common enemy. You see NATO now suddenly starting to function, you know, because there is an external threat. So perhaps one could convince people. So the low lying islands that fight against the rising uh, water, they have been very functional over the last uh, decade. So, so look for these plans. But I think it's essential in your story about collaboration and, and more collaborative action that we find these, these ways to connect that collaboration to human behavior, no? Y yes, it is. But I think... Perhaps one should rather start acting where one can, rather than spending all one's energy trying to get everyone along. And I'll give you one example. When we recommended that we should introduce electric cars in Norway in my commission 15 years ago, of course, everyone said they're so expensive, we can't do this. You know, people will not buy a car which is three times as expensive as, as the other one. And then we sat down and tried to figure out how could we lure people into buying those cars. And we had two very good ideas. The first one, we said, anyone who buys these expensive cars can drive in the bus only lane so that they can bypass the morning traffic. That was in itself enough, you know, that a large number of rich people, you know, bought those cars. It was, of course, unjust from an equity point of view, but it worked. The second rule that we did propose that did not work was that in Norway, it's, you can't drive if you're drunk. So we proposed at that time that those guys who drive 
electric cars, since they're so small and the mass is so light, they would be allowed to drink half a liter of beer before they drove home. That was not passed. <laughs> Let me uh, turn to uh, one of our colleagues, Kwame Wusu Boteng in uh, the continent of Africa. He says the continuous movement of the rich and elite to the top of most countries is creating social tensions across the globe. How will rich and powerful be ready to provide more for the masses and how do banks change this trend? That's a wonderful question. And the answer is as easy as anything. Unionize. Join the right party. These are the, so we, I mean, okay, I belong to the elite, but, but uh, I belong to the normal people most of my life. You know, so the only way we are the majority. We just so need collect, to collective action. So it's the, you, you build collectives um, exactly. to develop that. Yeah, exactly. and and is that sufficient? Is that is that going to get? Oh, for sure. Uh, our country is, of course, the best example. It's of course harder to do these things in nations with hundreds and hundreds of millions of people. But the Chinese managed. You know, mm. so they. Uh, you know, it's not the rich Chinese to, who took control of China. You know, it is the Chinese who have taken control of China. Yet the history of unions is very much about, uh, you know, frictions and collective bargaining. How do you get how do you get uh, collective action or unions or uh, to see that we have a common goal going forward or f common five turnarounds that we need to focus on? It's only one way to do that. And this is to be aware of the fact that there is actually here a profit sharing arrangement. You know, what the labor unions take is what the owners do not get and what the owners and vice versa. So there must be a balance here in some way or the other. And that balance has clearly been uh, in the disfavor of the work, workers over the last 40 years. In the preceding 40 years, it was somewhat different, particularly in the United States and, uh, and in our part of the world. But the Anglo-Saxon developments, you know, the liberal market economy that has evolved over the last 40 years is not a fair deal. You know, it, it is giving much too much to the owners. Of and course, the, of course, the owners disagree, but they are in a minority. So I think they, for once, should have to yield. Yeah, yeah. And I think you've outlined the consequences of not yielding. Upendra Payudal, our, our colleague uh, from Nepal, asks, emerging markets are going to face bigger challenges uh, of the need for huge resource mobilization, particularly in terms of adaptation measures. How are they going to meet these funding needs as developed countries would be constrained themselves by the need to meet their mitigation needs? So what we are formally proposing in the current drafts of, uh, of our report, which only appears in, in June, is the establishment of a new international monetary authority that actually prints money and gives to the poor. You know, that's uh, calling a spade a spade. But it's, of course, packaged in the way that financial people like to package things. So it looks as if that is not what is going on. But the idea is basically to make sure that there is an offshore pool of money that can then be uh, accessed by people who are planning to use it for some decent purpose, you know, as opposed to making the president rich or the... Uh, you know, building castles and things like this. And on the public side, isn't the Global Green Fund designed to do this? Well, for sure. But here, you know, you need orders of magnitude, you know, to understand what's going on. This is just like the taxonomy of, of, of the EU. You know, clearly the taxonomy is helpful because it tells banks, you know, which projects they should at least shy away from but uh, of course it, what it doesn't do is then to show how much more profitable some of the dirty things are mm. think about it now you know yeah and and there are folks in europe who say that the the taxonomy has been compromised already yes oh for sure 
and uh, anything that reaches agreement is compromised. I mean, there is no way you can get a pure idea, you know, established as a minor as a majority view. So one has to live with half good solutions rather than wasting one's time trying to get the perfect solution. So continue on is is the measure that you're. Yes, looking it at. is. And, and 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 the other thing I was thinking about, you know, the green bond uh, saga that uh, has now been around for a long, long time. You know, I find it totally amazing that someone believes that the 0.5% per year, you know, cheaper credit is going to change the world. I mean, that is, so yes, I know it's going on. And yes, I know that it's increasing uh, traction. But if you start expressing it as percent of what is needed in the form of shifting capital flows from, from fossil fuels to, to windmills, you know, it is not very much. So we've got but to make helps. the realistic but, numbers visible is what you're yeah. saying. Yeah. 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 But one shouldn't stop doing it because it's, but one shouldn't lure oneself once more into believing that there is a solution. This is just, I'm surprised that no one has spoken about the carbon tax, you know, this far, which has, of course, for 30 years now been the excuse used by all economists that, you know, if we could just have a carbon tax, then, you know, the problem would be solved. That's very true. If we had had a carbon tax of 100 or $200 per ton of CO2 equivalent for 30 years, the problem would have been solved. The problem is that you don't manage to get it passed. Uh, Peter Blom, uh, not carbon tax, but carbon currency, he suggests, should we introduce a carbon currency, a reward in some way? It, <laughs> Like when we started writing Limits to Growth 50 years ago, these ideas still would have mattered, you know, because we at that time had perhaps 100 years, perhaps 50 years. Now that the problem is within the next 30 years, we shouldn't invent new things like this. We should take, we know how to build windmills, we know how to make solar panels, we should build them all over the place. We should build large scale in the poor world and, and then ask for the money back 50 years in the future after they have industrialized using the, the new electricity. And we need the money in 50 years time when we are very old and need the money back. So there you could do deals that, that really would matter. But of course, at once when you propose this to one of my boards, you know, some idiot says that, you know, I, I don't I want my money back, you know, in five years or in 15 years, not my grandchildren. So but, but that's, there, there is wonderful opportunity for people who have long term perspectives here. And do you see any hope uh, in cryptocurrencies, asks Anthony Norman? You feel that the trend will aid or hinder or deliver some form of equitable equitable distribution? I think the uh, the ledger uh, side of the cryptocurrency, you know, the, the the open book, that's a very good idea, useful. I think you know if you want a term something that uh, money. Because that's what you're talking about. You just, I think we can do well with what we have. It's interesting to, again to look at what the Chinese are doing because they have, of course, 18, uh, sorry, they have eight doubled their GDP per person in 40 years for 1.4 billion people. So they have been doubling the GDP per person every decade. You can ask, how have they do this? And, and I don't accept answers of the type they're communists. And consequently, uh, you know, it's a piece of cake for communists to do. So what they have done, they have made five-year plans, quarreled like hell, made them realistic so that they are executable with the manpower and capital that exists in a nation. Then they have printed the money that is necessary to fund this, given it to policy banks, one policy bank being responsible for building 15 airports, another one being responsible for building, et cetera, et cetera. And they do the business of handing out the money. 
And after a while, you know, they have all the airports and they have a policy bank who has a big debt to the central bank. But does, who owns both the policy bank and the central bank? It is, of course. Uh, so I think wise central bank policy is one of the tools that hopefully, you know, could be used by, by nations that have their own currency uh, in order to, to, to build the country. But again, yeah. it requires trust. It requires a modicum of, of uh, administrative capacity, et cetera, et cetera. So it's yeah. not easy. Yeah. And, and as uh, Irene Wildeveski points out, these uh, measures are often promoted in the North uh, in international organizations, which makes it hard to um, see this into the developing world and to, I, I like to say, the most of the world, not rest of the world. Uh, that is true. Luckily, we do have in our project uh, a Libyan uh, economist who is has uh, explored, or I, I think he has even done it, you know, how to use this type of, of financial manipulation, which uh, you know, one would call it, in order to, to build a nation. But as I said, it's like in Norway, who built, 200 gentlemen built this country from 1945 to 1965, when the uh, right wing started to take over. And it's clear that, you need a 200 man group or woman group who is not corrupt and who is not you know making themselves rich first and and yeah. I, I know that this is incredibly difficult yeah yeah and uh, it's the scalar issue isn't it well, let me leave now jurgen with one final question you have been uh, a pioneer in developing systems models that look at the world and try to challenge our assumptions and our thinking for, for more than 50 years. What, how do you hold an eye for possibility? What sustains you as you, <laughs> oh. as you come up with yet a new book and, and look forward? <laughs> normally I answer this question by saying there is nothing else to do. You know, it, it, it's too, I mean, yes, it has been an uphill battle and we haven't gotten very far in 50 years compared to the challenge. Uh, but what else is there to do? I mean, uh, one cannot simply sit down and play golf, you know, when the, the world is going to hell. So I, I guess it is simply the hope that that, or, or actually it's the conviction that it is fully possible to make a better world than the one that we will get, you know. So uh, although the, the one we will, might get, could get, isn't perfect, it's at least better than what we would otherwise have gotten. So I presume that is what keeps me up. Thank you, Jorgen. Um, and big virtual applause from everyone. Uh, thank you, everyone, for contributing to uh, the chat. We're now going to go to the premium stage. So those of you who've been in the, this stage, uh, we say farewell to you. And for our CEOs and invited guests, we're now going to shift to the premium stage, where we'll have three of our CEOs who will be uh, adding to the richness of this conversation by sharing their own perspectives from different parts of the world. So let's go there now. And uh, we look forward to seeing you. That would be something where you would push a button over on that side that says uh, now in terms of where we need to be. Thanks very much. And thanks to you again. And thanks for all the questions.